Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this Saturday, July 23rd, which is an absolutely amazing card. Um, some really good fights, really good fights from a fan perspective, really good fights from a DFS perspective, and really good fights from a uh, from a uh, from a sweat perspective because they start at 11 in the morning. This being UFC uh, London, uh, which means that. You don't have to stay up till one, two in the morning to get through all these. And it's, it's going to be a really, really good card. Um, uh, it's also extremely instructive with respect to uh, DFS in a way that we haven't seen in a while. Um, there, there was a whole mess of, of, of UFC cards um, for a, a year that were really instructive and really just kind of captured, you know, the essence of what is required to win DFS. You know, you had a good combination of, of big long shots, big underdog, uh, excuse me, uh, big favorites, some favorites that had finishing upside, some that didn't, some of the wrestling upside, some that didn't. And over the last month or so, the, the cards have been pretty poor. And I don't mean from a, just a fan perspective or a quality perspective. I mean, from kind of a DFS perspective, it wasn't the same kind of puzzle that I, I'm, I'm used to trying to solve. And, Quite honestly, the, the cards were much less interesting. Um, I think this card is extremely interesting, which means that I am uh, very interested in it. Um, first of all, let's take a look. Uh, there are 13 fights uh, as of now. I hope that none drop off. And the first thing I will say is that the main event is awesome. Um, it's awesome from a, a competitive perspective. It's awesome from a, a quality perspective. It's awesome from a DFS perspective because you have an 8,300 and 7,900 fight and both of these guys score. I mean, Aspinall is extremely active. He can finish uh, with the best of them. He also does have some wrestling upside. Then you have Curtis Blades, who is, who is an extremely strong wrestler, which means that he's capable of piling up some big, big scores and he has KO upside also. And these guys have five rounds to work with. This is going to be an interesting decision of whether you need to lock this fight in because it's, it's hard to fade. I mean, in the abstract, you know, this is exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for good pricing, meaning everything that these guys close together. So you're really not sure who's going to win. And really good win conditions for both sides. I mean, if either of these guys wins, they're just, they just have to score a hundred, I think. Um, so it, it is a tough, tough thing to fade these guys. Um, but that said, there are, the, there is the possibility that you can get, you know, five guys or six guys to outscore them. But at least in my first look, I don't think that that's going to be the likely outcome. I do believe that, that, playing this main event is going to be the wise move. Now, as usual, uh, the main event is going to be highly owned. So uh, this is, as almost always, uh, th this seminal decision. I am probably going to end up uh, locking it in, um, but I could change my mind. But, but as of now, that's kind of where I'm at. I literally have no opinion on the fight, except that it's going to be great. Um, and... I, I, my only opinion is whoever score, whoever wins this is going to score hundred fantasy points and they're 8,300 or less. So you, you, you kind of want that. All right. Next thing I want to do is I want to look at some of these fights kind of together. All right. And, and there's one fight that I want to kind of highlight here, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. So you see, you have a bunch of these favorites. You have some minus 500s, minus a couple of minus 300s, minus 400 you know, uh, another minus 300. And what you'll see from a DFS perspective is not all minus 300s are created equal, okay? Um, we'll take a look, for example, let's look at, at Nick, the Nicholas Dalby fight. So Nicholas Dalby, he's a big favorite, minus 260. But if you look for, you know, the, uh, the KO upside, Dalby winning inside the distance, they have him at plus 150. So he's not really even favored to win inside the distance. Um, so when you have that at a price tag of, let's see what Dalby is here of 8,800, um, it's, 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 he's not too expensive to play, but he's almost too expensive to play. You know, when you see, compare him to some of these other inside the distance props, you, you'll see what I'm talking about here. And then you get to Jai Herbert, 
Jai Herbert, he's a minus 260, 270, same thing. You look at him and he is basically a pick em to finish, uh, a pick em to win by TKO. I want you to hold on to that for a second because there are other fighters here that are also right around pick em to, to finish, but we'll get to that. Mason Jones, he's a minus 300. We don't all have all the props on him yet, um, but you'll see that the under one and a half rounds is only minus 145. So I'm expecting him to have a pretty poor inside the distance prop. So unless he's got extreme amount of grappling upside, which I doubt, um, he's going to be probably not the, not the best 9K plus fighter from a DraftKings perspective. Um, then you get to Muhammad Malkaev, who is also minus, well, he's minus 500 actually. And what he has, he's got both going for him. Not only does he have, number one, a good inside the distance prop, um, Mokaev inside the distance about Pickham, but he also has the wrestling and the grappling upside. So he's got two ways, maybe two and a half ways to win, to, to score well. He can either, you know, satisfy his inside the distance prop and that, you know, at Pickham is probably going to score 100 if he does. But also he can rack up a decent score in a decision. You know, like if he pits three rounds of takedowns and control time, that, that, that scores over a hundred, uh, I don't say easily, but can score over a hundred without too much stress. And then you have the combination of being able to get that maybe late second round finish uh, after a bunch of takedowns. So he's a, a really, really elite play on this card. Um, we'll get back to Pierce for in a minute, um, but, but just to kind of show you some differences. So Nathaniel Wood, like he's a minus 500, but he, you look at this, uh, inside the distance, he is only, I mean, he's plus 200, you know? So, so that to me is, I mean, how, I'm just curious how they're expecting him to win. I mean, it just, he's, he doesn't really have, he's not a, a elite grappler by any stretch. I guess they think he's just going to piece him up and get an easy decision. Um, it's almost a kind of a fishy inside the distance prop. I mean, I almost, I almost want to bet him inside the distance because I mean, that's, it doesn't leave yourself a lot of room for error. If you're going to say, okay, he's a minus 500, you know, five to one favorite. And it's really unlikely he finishes, uh, for, for a male fight, that's, that doesn't happen all that often. So, um, I think something might be amiss here, but from a DFS perspective, unless this, this, you know, inside the distance prop comes down somehow. I mean, this is, this is an extremely poor play at, at whatever he's 9,400. Um, Mark Diakisi, he's another minus 300, but you look at him, he is Diakisi inside this, he's a plus 140. So like compare that to say a Jai Herbert, who's basically the same, you know, well, maybe a little less likely to win, but just that much more likely to finish. I mean, is extremely much stronger play to play someone like Jai Herbert than, say, Mark Diakasey. Um, I did promise we'll get back to the Pierce one in a minute. Uh, let's go on to, well, let's let's go to the Pimblet one first. So Patty Pimblet, he's another minus 300. And let's look at his inside the distance. So he is inside the distance is about a pick em, minus 130. So it's likely he finishes inside the distance, distance, which is so far the best inside the distance prop there is. Not to mention the fact that he's got some grappling upside as well. So Pimblet is, uh, I, th I think he's, he's the best one, okay? And you know what he has going for him? I think this is going for him. At least the early looks, as far as the industry goes, people would like to fade him and, and maybe they're not going to fade him this week, but this is what I hear throughout the industry. Um, you know, he wasn't too impressive last time. I'm going to fade him. I don't like him, whatever, but maybe not this time. And for whatever reason, I don't think Pimblet is going to get the same degree of ownership that he should given his inside the distance prop. Um, and, you know, and, and I guess the reason why is because Jordan Levitt, I guess, has some grappling upsides and takedowns as well, but, Pimlet's big, and, and I don't know. I, I I think that this number is extremely strong from a DFS perspective, and I I, I think that that him 
and Makayev are clearly the best plays of these spend ups. Um, uh, so let's go to what I feel actually might be the best GPP play of them all. Um, and again, I did say we're going to get back to Pierce. Well, you know, let's do this one first, and then we'll get back to what I think might be the best. So Jonathan Pierce against Amir Akani. Um, the inside the distance prop isn't that great for Pierce, for example. Um, Pierce inside the distance, you know, plus 115, not that bad. But he's got some wrestling upside. Um, uh, so when you combine his, you know, okay inside the distance prop with his grappling and, and, and some uh, – a wrestling upside. I think he's an extremely strong play. I think Amir Khani is going to be an overbet uh, underdog because of his last fight. His last fight, nobody wanted to play him and he got a first round sub. And I feel as though recency bias is keeping this, uh, keeping interest on him a little bit too high. So I just have a feeling that he's going to be popular in DFS. So, so, um, well, we'll see ownerships throughout the week, but uh, I think that combined with what I just said about Jonathan Pierce, I think Jonathan Pierce is an extremely strong play here. Um, okay, so let's talk about, well, well, we'll get back to the Paul Craig fight in a second, but we'll, we'll talk about the other ones. Hannah Goldie versus Molly McCann. So Molly McCann is a minus 400, but look at this inside the distance prop. I mean, McCann inside the distance is plus 230. I mean, no thanks. And this is exactly the type of fight you don't want to target in DFS. Um, can you you could play it in cash? I mean, she's probably going to win, and you know, she's probably going to score about seventy. You know, and that's not going to be good enough for her price tag. Um, so l- let's talk about Craig versus Ozdemir because I think this is going to—I don't know—at least an early look. This could be the key fight, and I'm going to get into why. I believe that Paul Craig is going to be the most popular underdog on the slate. And the reason why that is, I mean, it makes somewhat sense. I mean, he's got four straight wins. <laughs> Not only do you have four straight wins, but it's win first round by sub, win second round TKO, win first round KO TKO, and win first round by sub. Okay. I mean, how do you not want to play this? All right. Um, and not only that, but but, you know, he, he looks like sometimes he's going to lose this is earlier fights and he throws up these triangles. He's really, really tough. And he like he doesn't mind being taken to the ground. He likes to pull stuff from his back. It's 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 exactly the type of guy that people are going to want to play. But when you look at the inside the distance prop on Ozdemir and I have no idea who this guy is. OK, but you have. Ozdemir win by TKO at plus one twenty. Okay, um, essentially he's a pick'em to finish, and he is a pick'em to finish just like all these other guys, just like Herbert, just like Mokayev, just like um, Pierce. Okay, but the difference here is that he is against an extremely popular fighter. So I believe that Ozdemir is going to be an extremely strong leverage play. I don't think anybody's going to really want to play him. Uh, And I think that people are going to be forced into this, into this Paul Craig play. Okay. Because when you look at some of these underdogs, um, they're rough, you know, they're rough. And again, I will get back to the Mandy bomb thing in a minute, but some of these underdogs are really rough to play. Um, so I think the Paul Craig play is going to be a, a natural, you know, DFS ownership magnet. Okay. It's not like you can get uh, Curtis blades like that cheap. Like people, people are going to play Curtis blades at 7,900, wherever he is. But aside from him, every other underdog is re- seems really fishy on, at least on paper. So you get a chance to play Paul Craig here coming off all these first round KOs and second round subs and all this stuff. Um, people are going to do it. And I, I do believe that Ozdemir is, you know, going to be the strong leverage play. And you check this out. I mean, he's coming off of two straight losses. Okay. Now look, he was against, uh, Yuri. Okay. And Ankalaev, whatever, 
But I just I don't know how any is anybody's going to play a guy off of two straight losses against a guy with four straight first round wins who's you know who's an underdog who has grappling ups. You know what I mean? I just feel as though that this could be the the leverage play of the week, and that would be Ozdemir. Um, and again, do I have an opinion on the fight? Now, really, this is when I'm really just going by the odds here. I'm going to say, okay, you know, he's minus 160 for a reason. And he's also, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if this line comes down, by the way, uh, making all, making Paul Craig even more popular. Um, uh, but the fact of the matter is, he's about to pick him to finish. And, you know, if he finishes in the first round, uh, then you want that. And even in the second round, and keep in mind, remember, Paul Craig doesn't mind getting, you know, doing stuff off his back. Those guys are some, you know, you, you want to you want to target fighters against guys like that as well. Because if Paul Craig doesn't put up that submission, then all you're getting is Ozdemir on top just pounding on him, you know. So uh, I think this is an extremely strong play this week. All right. Um, I didn't go over Mandy Baum versus Victor, Victoria Leonardo. This is the only thing I will say about this fight. And again, this probably means nothing. This is like MMA math to the finest. But I will say this, Victoria Leonardo, she was opened up as a pick against Manon Fioro, who is just the best in the division. Um, so I only may say that because, you know, maybe it's possible that Leonardo just was well-regarded at some point. Um, so maybe she has some value here, but that that's pretty much all I had to say about that fight, actually. Probably not going to play it inside the distance prop four and all this stuff. Um, okay, just a couple of more fights to go over here. One is Krylov versus Gustafson. So, you know, I, I don't know how many people are going to play Gustafson. He's coming off like a year layoff or so. And let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. You have Kreloff, who is uh, inside the distance, plus 120. That's pretty good, plus grappling upside. This is a strong play. You know, this is very similar to the Jonathan Pierce play. As a matter of fact, it's almost exactly the same as the Jonathan Pierce play. So I think that Kreloff and Pierce are both really strong. Um, can I play Gustafson? I mean, I truly don't like playing guys off of your layoffs, but I mean, you have to think of that's factored into the price. To win by TKO is plus 420. Oh, I don't know, man. I, I just, I don't think I can do it. Um, I, so I think Kreloff's a really strong play. Let's put it that way. All right. So now uh, I talked about Blades Espinal. Now you have Chris Curtis versus Jack Hermanson. And this is a, this is rough. You know, it, it's, it's a pick em fight. Uh, it's also a, a pick them as far as the DraftKings pricing, pretty much. They're both about the same price. And you have kind of a contrast in styles here. You have Jack Hermanson, who really is going to need to take this fight to the ground to win. And Chris Curtis has displayed just extreme takedown defense since he got into the UFC. Um, so, and, and Curtis is uh, striking is clearly superior to Hermanson. So it's, uh, it seems stylistically to be a tough spot for, for Hermanson yet <laughs> it's still only pick him. I, I, you know, who's, who's taking Hermanson, but I think the reason for that is, you know, Curtis, if you look at when he came first came into the USC, he came in a couple of fights ago as a 6,800 underdog and, and nobody believed that he could do anything. And he knocked them out, got him first round. And then that wasn't good enough. The second time out, they thought it was a fluke. They made him 6,600 again, and he won by two TKO. And then that's not good enough. They made him only 8,600, and he won here. A pretty clear decision, three rounds against an incredible grappler. Um, I mean, what does this guy got to do to get some respect? <laughs> you know, so uh, I do think that he's still probably underpriced, So, which is why I, I'm not that worried too much about the fishiness of the whole thing. Um, I do think that Curtis is the better play here. And I will probably end up playing more of him than Hermanson. Um, but, you know, it's a win condition player. If, if Hermanson does get him to the ground, then Hermanson's in great shape at 8K. So um, I will say that, believe it or not, I think that Hermanson is 
probably more of the must play from this fight because I think Curtis could win and not score well. You know, I think that if Curtis does not get a KO, he could he could win a kind of a sloppy decision, not sloppy decision, but he could win like a 75 point decision, which you're not necessarily going to want at 8,200. But I don't think that Hermanson can win without getting the takedowns he needs to score well. So I actually feel as though Hermanson is the better, you know, the guy I'm going to want to have more of than Curtis um, from a win condition perspective. Um, so so that that's pretty much it, you know. Now, one thing I didn't really recommend are that many underdogs. I mean, so so what are you going to do here? I mean, can you can you get away with with playing, you know, no underdogs? No, this this is a problem with with these. Oh, you could totally do this. Like if you play Blades, and I can't fill this lineup up for you. I mean, look, you're not you're not going to be able to play. Is the problem like you're not going to really even play Herbert? And you know what I mean. Like you can play one of these guys, but you can't play say Herbert and Mokayev if you play this way. Without having, well, you could, but now you're going to need like a you're going to need to play one of these one of these bow wows. We don't really want to play like Rosa, yikes, you know, or um, or Goldie. Or this one might not be so bad against Dia Casey, but I mean like that, this is what you're going to have to do if you want to play two of these guys. But if, if you can get away with, you know, those two mid rangers, like, I don't know, like Pierce and who's the other guy, Krilov, then you can get away with the middling build and then, you know, uh, what, well, what else can you do here, actually? We've already used all the middlers. Yeah, this is rough. This is rough. You're still going to have to dip into some of these underdogs here. Um, so what I would do is I would probably, you know, just highlight the, ooh, let's go back. Let's go, you know, let's put in that my, that key play, that that leverage player. Let's put in Ozdemir and see what he is. Oh, he's in here already. And this is why this Paul Craig thing becomes such a, a I don't say a must play, but such a popular play is even I'm trying to just do other things and it's hard to do, you know? What about, you're going to have to play someone like Silva or in non pimblet lineups, you're going to have to play Levitt. Yikes. That's rough. You know, what about Kyle Nelson? Can he do anything? Can he be Herbert? I mean, he does have a he does have a, a first round KO on his resume here, but I don't know. That's rough. Um, can you play Leonardo? Can that is that good enough? Leonardo seventy eight hundred. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. Is that what this is going to come down to? Having to play one of these like pick and women fighters? Maybe. But um, nonetheless, I, I think this is a really, really good card. And I think I did a decent job of identifying what types of plays we want to play. But let me, let me just kind of review. So of the spend ups, um, let's, let's, do, let's do it this way. Of the spend ups, I don't want to play Nathaniel Wood. I don't want to play Molly McCann. I don't want to play Dia Keeks. I would want to play Mokayev, Herbert, or Pimba. I don't even need to play Dalby. I'd much rather play Pierce or Krylov than Dalby, for example. But I do think that Ozmir is a really, really good leverage play over which is probably going to be a very popular Paul Craig. Uh, this main event is probably one you want to lock in, uh, Aspinall Blades. Uh, Curtis Hermanson, uh, I think that, you know, probably, probably whoever wins this fight makes optimal, but I don't think Curtis necessarily does. So I think that I would probably prefer Hermanson. Um, and then as far as underdogs go, yeah. I mean, our, Amir Khani is very, is very live at 7,500. Um, and I would honestly just kind of play all the underdogs in the fights, you know, in fights where I don't have the opposing fighter, you know, because one of them is going to win. I just don't know exactly which, ones it's gonna, which one it's going to be. Um, uh, that will do it. 
uh, if I have anything to follow up with after a canceled fight or something like that, I will do it uh, later on in the week. But uh, I think this is where we're headed this week. Uh, good luck. And uh, as my friend Rody would say, let's get it.